Hi guys, this month we explore the exciting world of capitalism or debates that involve capitalist ide ideals or ideologies and philosophies. And don't worry, uh, our goal is not to convert you into socialists or God forbid communists, but to have a better and deeper understanding about this world that is inherently uh, capitalist, right? So. Capitalism has won, but capitalism is not perfect. Capitalism, just like democracy, is you know the worst possible way of running any market, except every other possible way of running the market, right? So this week we're going to start with uh, capitalism and the individual, and look at how uh, the, the individual is expected to thrive or behave in a capitalist environment. Uh, and then look at a few debates in that uh, in that in that area. Okay, so what does capitalism say about the individual? Well, it says that the individual is king. That whatever the individual wants to do, that the individual is free to do. Capitalism is very very big on freedom of the individual, right? Uh, and you know, freedom the freedom to to move, the freedom to trade, the freedom to travel in a in a free market fully free market, purely capitalist framework, the individual should have as many choices as possible to buy, but also to create or, or to sell. Okay, so within the freedom of the individual. So in the capitalist uh, philosophy says that this allows the individual the most uh, a amount of avenues for, pro for progress, right? So if the individual can buy whatever they want, can sell whatever they want. Uh, through that, the individual will develop and the individual will thrive, okay? And when the individual becomes more powerful, then the individual will trickle down the wealth and help everybody else in the economy. The individual in a capitalist framework is rational uh, and also greedy or motivated by, by greed, among, among other things. Uh, and that will drive the individual to succeed, okay? So that's basically the economic uh, capitalist framework. And to a large extent, it's true and it has worked. Capitalist countries grow much faster than non-capitalist countries uh, and have far more wealth and are far more developed, right? But lately, we've also discovered that uh, while it does help growth, it doesn't really help equitable distribution of wealth in those countries. Uh, America, the prime example of a capitalist nation, is also one of the most inequitable nations and it doesn't allow for a lot of social mobility. So it's great if you're a rich person in America, but not so great if you're a poor person in America and there are increasingly more poor people in America. And this asks, uh, begs the question, you know, of how is then capitalism a framework, not just for these developed countries now, because many of their citizens are suffering, but for developing countries, because they are the ones who are rushing into capitalism to try to develop. Um, and if it's not a great frame, framework to distribute wealth, then maybe if I'm a poor country, that's not really going to work for me very much, right? And we have some examples of countries that aren't really full on in, in the capitalist way of developing, like, like China or South Korea as, the, as the, in the past, uh, but have done really, really well in, in current times, okay? So we're not going to go into the full developing, non-developing nation yet, but keep in mind the context here is what's fair for citizens in a country uh, that is capitalist and in, in different types of countries, so countries that are developed and countries also that are developing, all right? And, and whether or not they, uh, they, it, it best helps individuals in those countries, okay? So I'm going to break down these myths, but but, but generally, I'll, I'll say that, you know, you, you keep in mind um, that the capitalist's uh, philosophy around individual rights is to give that individual as much freedom as possible, to treat that individual as a fully rational actor, and to say that the individual is generally motivated by greed. Uh, why this often doesn't work is, to some extent, it can be uh, counterintuitive, right? So if the individual is fully motivated by greed, then it's less likely that things will trickle down and help other people, okay? So this is most likely not going to happen if individual just wants to help themselves. Uh, furthermore, if you always think that the individual is only looking out for themselves and not really for other people, it becomes very, very hard 
to build successful companies or, or communities because they're always distrusting each other, right? And so that uh, can count against, uh, the, like philosophically, it really just doesn't, doesn't make sense when you talk about the effectiveness of capitalism. Um, I'll put a little bit more context because I know it's getting a little bit, very, very, a little bit abstract uh, and discuss a few topics, okay? So let's look at three. And these are the three that I want to talk about today. Okay, so the first one is about tax, our good friend tax. I know we all love talking about tax. Every debate about taxation will come down primarily to one about capitalism. Whenever anybody wants to raise taxes, people will call them socialist, right? And say that you are doing very bad things uh, by trying to create flat societies. Or it says that it harms individuals because now individuals won't work so much or punishes them because those individuals, you know, had developed so much success uh, on their own uh, and they deserve to retain that success, okay? So that's fundamentally what this debate is about. The trade-off between, uh, uh, or, or the challenge in creating uh, flatter societies, okay? And whether or not a flatter society is a fairer society, right? So on one hand, the pro-capitalists will say that it's fair because you get to keep what you built. So I'm very rich uh, and that's because I worked very hard and that's fair. And anybody who works hard can be rich, right? On the other hand, there's the anti-capitalists or capitalist skeptics, let's say, just to be a little bit more even-handed about it, will say that, well, two things. One, not everything that you built, you built on your own. You still had a government and you had education and infrastructure and all these things around you, so you need to give back. But why do you have to give back this much, right? But secondly, say that uh, it's not necessarily, the wealth doesn't trickle down, doesn't pass down until someone like steps in and breaks it. And the biggest barrier to that is inheritance. Uh, as you'll see in the book, we show how even many of the capitalists, in fact, Adam Smith uh, and founding fathers of America, were against this notion of inheritance because it creates a landed class. And if you can pass down wealth from one to another to another, that wealth tends to be, re to be retained in some groups versus other groups. What that does is creates monopolies on success. And if I'm really successful, I can pass down my success to others, then it's very, very difficult for people to move up. And the more successful I am, the more likely uh, I'll be able to retain and hold on to that success, okay? So the two major clashes in this debate is one is what is fair um, to whether to take away people's wealth or to, to let it let them have it right and this will uh, go into things about how responsible were they individually to hold on to their wealth and how much of them are you harming them uh, and secondly in terms of the broader society will it create a better society fairer society or not okay so that's the first one a huge very very important debate and and and, uh, and an issue or uh, around capitalism that will come up quite a bit. Uh, I'm going to skip the second one because we're going to talk about this in the topic that, or today, later. Uh, and the third one, so this is another issue when it comes to, uh, you know, how capitalism affects the individuals, right? So again, so individual success is based on individual merit. So if you work hard, you will succeed, right? So the pro-capitalist free market approach would be to you know remove barriers have equal opportunity right uh, this is the, the the power feminism type and say that eventually people will break through the barriers and then they will grow and that's how change and transition happens the anti-capitalist side need says that we need intervention right so in, in if you remember from when we discussed about social change we need to have some kind of radical, uh, disruptive, uh, a top-down approach, which is what affirmative action is, which is what this topic is about, because there are structural problems, right? And to some extent, even free market capitalists will accept some kind of restrictions, right? Uh, you know, antitrust law, for example, whenever there's a monopoly that has been created by a certain group over another. And one can argue that when you know, such a small number of senior positions are taken up by women. In Europe, it's like something like 4 or 5%, or may then just be like maybe in Germany, uh, are, of these senior positions or board positions are represented by women, then in effect, there is a monopoly. 
And when there is such a powerful monopoly, it's very unlikely that the market will organically break it, right? So that's the tension in the debate. From the, from the side that is arguing against this, you would say that we need government intervention to break it. Capitalism also on its own, the free market, only really works when there is some kind of symmetry of power. And when there's too much power imbalance, then someone needs to step in and shake things up a little bit, right? So uh, that's in regards to that to the, to, to the to the third topic. Okay, hope that made sense. Let's get into education. Now, I like this issue because it if affects. Uh, I think it, it overlaps uh, two major issues. So one is the context, a theme this week about capitalism. Um, and development. Now, you may say like, wait, what's the relationship? It seems more like it's an education issue to me. But how it ties in with capitalism is that pro-free market companies or well, not comp pro companies and nations will say that what you need to do is develop yourself. And if yourself is developed, either through education or just entrepreneurship or something, then you will do well, right? So many companies just focus on developing individuals. And by with the hope that after developing individuals, those individuals will go on to develop their community. Um, that's not always true. And the counter narrative to that is you need to develop communities to infrastructure, build networks so that the individuals can place in. And individuals are just individuals. Individuals don't succeed on their own without a bigger picture, without government, without community. Okay. So that's why I think it, this debate's quite interesting. And the second reason is because it's about education. And many, many countries, especially in the developing world, have put all their chips into the education basket and now realizing that maybe that's not really playing out. Uh, and we see this even in the developed world, right? Many, many, many people have degrees, but that de those degrees don't always translate into progress. Uh, and you used to get what people called like a graduation bump. Uh, people with degrees who graduate from universities will earn significantly more. Um, they still earn more than those who don't, but that's begin. The gap is beginning to, to narrow, and to some in some situations, it may actually be more harmful if you studied, uh, you know, went to university uh, instead of just joining the workforce. Okay, so we'll get into the details more, but that's why um, I like this. Just why I you know chose it, of course. So I hand in the matter. Um, let's get to it. Okay, so how should we set up this debate? I think these few things are really, really important. The first thing to keep in mind is that this debate is about this regret issue. So you're not actually proposing something, although it'd be nice if you have a position on uh, what you think the solution should be. Um, but it's about evaluating, right? And it's about evaluating the emphasis, or as you will put here, the overemphasis. So you're not arguing that education is bad and no one should get education, but you're saying that it isn't the only way, right? Or maybe even the main way. So governments who invest in education or encourage people to get education shouldn't only do that or shouldn't do that without ensuring that the other frameworks, other infrastructure exists, okay? Um, second thing is keep in mind the context. Um, I think this is focused on developing countries, right? I think that's important. Uh, because you're going to say, show how uh, the like some other fundamental factors are missing, like the infrastructure. But you, you can also be relevant to countries that are developed or who have you know, almost developed. Um, and finally, what is the comparison, right? I mentioned this earlier. So is it about a world where there is no education, right? You say that yeah, country should build some universities and tell people that education is good. But if the country is going to or, or has a keen interest in development and developing then that's not enough. They need to do a lot more other stuff as well. And maybe they shouldn't say that that's you know, a guaranteed success. Um, and people who don't get education should be able to build some success and stuff too, okay? So that's the general stuff. I don't think you need a lot more uh, details uh, for this topic. The stance basically is that, and this again, I think I've alluded to a little bit, that for development, and you want to keep the focus on development, we need comprehensive solutions, right? And by comprehensive here, we'll talk about government investment in the infrastructure. Okay, so 
government needs to help build companies. The government needs to do a lot more things than just educate. And hope everything works out. Here are the arguments I think you can run on Gov, and of, as usual, you may have others. The first one is that development requires infrastructure, going straight to the last thing I spoke about. Secondly, the negative impacts of over-education. And finally, how this whole individual narratives, uh, individual effort narrative thing can be quite helpful. Okay, so the first one, the education, the development requires infrastructure. And here, you go after that, that key part of the myth, right? The key part of the myth that all you need is to educate, and then the knowledge will build itself. People will you know, do things on their own because now they have talent. And that's what's making all these countries invest so much in education and making people just like put their life savings into education. Okay? And you say that that's not true. Okay? So countries that have highly, a highly educated uh, people workforce struggle to get jobs. Right? Look at India. India has an amazing education infrastructure. Many, many people end up getting educated, but they don't have enough jobs, right? So you get and people who are over-educated for those jobs. But you also have people who don't fit into that job, and I'll get into that uh, in the second part. But, but the first part, you're trying to show that education alone doesn't create these jobs, okay? So governments need to create the infrastructure for those jobs. And the infrastructure could be like physical infrastructure, um, which is, you know, ports, so companies will come, roads, so companies will come, and on, on all of these other things. Uh, it could be, you know, uh, procedures, so uh, loans or tax benefits or things that you need to do, subsidies to encourage companies to create, okay, the creation of companies and the creation of these jobs. Because if you don't do that, then it doesn't matter that I have a degree, I can't get a job somewhere. And if I wanted to start a job or, or a company, then it's harder without loans, without subsidies, and it's harder if the infrastructure doesn't support the creation of my job, right? In fact, if I had lots of subsidies and loans and good roads and ports and all these things, even without a degree, I can create jobs and I can work and I can build business, okay? so. We say that in terms of, the, of, of these developing countries rushing to build universities, maybe they shouldn't. Maybe they should be building factories, maybe they should be supporting the agricultural industry and telling people that you need to work in all of these things and not just get degrees. Because then what happens is people get all these degrees and then can't find jobs. Which leads us to the second part. Okay? So what then happens is people put all their bets, and this is what I mean by the narrow focus, into specific areas of development, right? So if I get a lot of people with engineering degrees, for example, randomly pick that example, or medical degrees, or like business or arts degrees, right? They end up getting stuck in those areas, you know? So 10 years ago, or maybe 15 years ago, IT was like a big thing, and it still is now, although at that point, people thought like the way to go with it and before the dot-com bubble burst, um, and I hope you know that, or maybe you were born after the dot-com bubble burst, which would be kind of cool. Um, all countries just wanted to like build IT infrastructure, and there was this thing about the knowledge economy, right? And people put the letter E in front of all kinds of stuff, and then that made those things cooler, or the letter I, you had I cars and E cars, and you know everything was like an E house, and everything was like IT and, and electronics and knowledge. And so people did all kinds of technical degrees, but then when they came out, you know, end up doing business jobs or end up working in areas that had nothing to do with their degrees because A, they realized they didn't really like it. They didn't think about the jobs. They were just thinking about the degrees and hoping that that would give them a better future. Uh, and B, just having all those degrees didn't mean that those jobs existed, right? So it, what this overemphasis on education pigeonholes people into very specific sectors, right? And pigeons hold, pigeon, pigeon holds the, the country to some extent in the sectors too, sectors too. And what it also does is that create issues where students either have degrees but they are overqualified for jobs and can't get those jobs or don't want to get those jobs or because they have student loans and debt, they need to find jobs that will pay, help them pay their debt, right? And, and when they have so much debt, 
it really strangles the, the, the economy. It doesn't allow them to take risks because now they have to stick in their job and uh, you know, if they don't pay that debt, the debt is going to increase, they don't service the debt, and then they, they can't take other loans to start businesses, they can't take loans to start houses, because they really have all this, this credit, all this debt on top of their heads, right? So, um, in this argument, you talk about how it can be harmful, both in terms of reducing the flexibility of the individuals and the country, and saddling individuals with lots of debt, both like education money debt, but also this like, you know, the, the knowledge debt, and now I feel like I have to do something in this area, all the time that they've been, they've been wasted, um, you know, in pursuing that degree, right? So if, if they really just wanted to uh, work in a business or, um, you know, work in sales, it, they may have been better off joining a company after graduation, rather than moving, so after graduating from high school, rather than doing a four year business degree, right? Because in those four years, they could have gained knowledge, they would have got pay, and it may have been more useful than studying for four years in a university. Okay, so that's the second argument. And finally, uh, you go after the big philosophy. You say this whole individual efforts narrative is harmful. And it's harmful because life isn't balanced, right? There is a big scale. And although all of us maybe are born with the same kind of gifts, some of us at the top have more money, you know, have better schooling, better education, have parents who will help them with their fine, you know, their, their, their buddies and uh, the network of bosses who will do much better, right? And the people at the bottom who don't have education, don't have all these other opportunities, and not just like university education, mind you, but preschool education and after school education. And even if they get that education, they may not have the family branding and the network to help them get these fantastic jobs. Right? So the narrative that all you need is education and then you'll be successful is a lie uh, because you don't just need education, you need so many other things and it can be harmful because then it puts so much pressure on that individual and individuals will blame themselves when they can't succeed, right? Although in, in where, where else it may not necessarily be, only their job, okay? So that, my friends, is a summary of the case that you can run to argue that we regret the emphasis on education. But aha, uh -huh, what will we do in opposition? I will tell you. On opposition, on opposition, I think, again, don't take an absolute extreme approach and say like, yeah, all this infrastructure stuff is nonsense. We only need the individual, right? But you, you do defend the capitalist mindset and framework, but with some balance, right? And I, you say that it's not that capitalists say that we don't need infrastructure. Capitalists say that individuals can create infrastructure. You go back a little bit to this narrative of the fantastic individuals, the Steve Jobs and Bill Gates of our generation, but even before that, the, the huge you know, magnets who build railroads across the country, countries and world and etc. Cetera, et cetera. And we need fantastic individuals to do all these things because we can't depend on governments, right? We can't depend on other people. Okay? So that's the first part here that I'm trying to get to that yeah, yeah, we need all this infrastructure and we're not saying that government should do absolutely nothing, but the soft aspects are the most important. So government should continue to invest in education and should empower individuals to be entrepreneurial, okay? Um, this was the, by, by mutual exclusive here, I mean, you, it's hard for you to say that we want governments to do all the things that you want to do as well, except we also want education then your line becomes too narrow, okay? So you have to take the pro-capitalist, free market, individual success approach and talk about why that's powerful, right? Otherwise you end up joining the other side, okay? So while you can say that infrastructure is important, you have to say that the education emphasis is right. And we need to put um, more emphasis on education and emphasis on uh, entrepreneurship and the individual uh, ability to succeed, okay? Education for the future. Uh, direct, straightforward. I don't see why that will not work. If done properly. Arguments. First one, on the power of education in um, the, for the future, right? In creating jobs. Secondly, for long-term nation building, and here you will expand into some other uh, wonderful benefits of education. And finally, how you can solve the problems that exist in the status quo. Okay, now depending on your strategy, you can move some of these arguments around, but I think these are the major, major things 
that you need to bring forth in opposition. So the first thing, fierce, fierce defense of education. Okay, so talk about why the future is knowledge intensive. Um, not just, you know, even if it's just manufacturing, then we need people with the knowledge to build new technology with manufacturing, right? This is knowledge that will help us not just, well, you can still do agriculture, but do it in a far more productive, efficient way. And for all those things that happen, we need that knowledge. Okay, that's how we can move into higher level services jobs, right? High level jobs, uh, which will end up giving you more value. So these are jobs with services or developing your own technology. Okay, otherwise you'll always be dependent on other people's technology and they will end up making more. So even if all my people work in factories, if they're making cars that belong or phones or anything and that technology belongs to someone else, then they will end up making a lot more uh, money from that technology. Okay. And we then, so build that down in detail. So this higher education will do these two, two things. One is attract jobs. You want to get the more knowledge intensive, uh, high value services jobs, or even if you're just manufacturing, manufacturing jobs that, you know, more talented people, more educated people can do and creating new jobs. You need education in order to create new technology and create these new jobs, right? Secondly, it's important for long-term nation building. And this can tie in a bit with the whole development aspect, right? If you get stuck in just low and low value jobs, then it's hard to develop the nation. But you can also talk about how education does other things. It creates more, you know, critically, critical, critical citizens. Writing's a bit off there, but uh, you know what I mean, right? Uh, it creates more well-rounded individuals, right? And all of these things are important for long-term nation building. Uh, and you try to take a bigger picture on the whole uh, development perspective, right? So focus on the, on the economy, but also focus on like the development of the nation uh, uh, otherwise, and how this creates like this free market of ideas uh, the, within the whole capitalist environment and why that's a wonderful thing, okay? Finally, that if there are problems, the problems are solved with better policies, okay? So this is a little bit preemptive, uh, but you can run it even if right, the other side doesn't talk about debt and stuff like that and say that they are very, very, very narrow, right? So if you want to deal with the problem of debt, if you want to deal with the problem of like social mobility, right? Um, with all these things, what you need is better policies. Policies to better distribute funds across to, to people who need them, policies that recognize talent and help individuals grow and develop, right? So not say that everybody's completely on their own, uh, that nations will be investing in education as they have done through building universities and so on and so forth. Um, but the way you do it is important, not just whether you are doing it or not doing it, okay? So that's the major line from off. Yes, the, you, you quite strongly and you know, support this individual aspect, um, and that in a capitalist free market environment, give people the freedom to develop jobs and give them the, uh, the education required to think and to work in, 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 high, uh, in high, highly technological, highly advanced areas, and they will thrive and create industry, but not just that, help build a strong nation. Um, on the other side, you say that that's not enough and the priority has been a little bit mismatched that nations that focus too much on education end up creating big gaps and worse, placing all the emphasis on the individual misses the big picture. That individuals can only do so much and it's harmful to say that um, if your life sucks, it's your fault, okay? Governments have a responsibility uh, to, to, to fix that and if they don't, then the whole nation's going to fail and it will be disastrous. Uh, and yeah, so we don't need to go back to socialism but recognize that capitalism may have some faults. Anyway, that's the first debate and uh, first issue for the first week of this theme and one that I think is really, really important because you are an individual in a capitalist framework. So good luck uh, and have fun debating about this issue.